Hey guys, the Slater Magic here, and it's time to do something that I haven't done in a while, but last time I did it was pretty popular. Well, there was a portion of you that were sadly uh, born without a sense of humor, and you didn't find it very funny, but um, for the rest of you, I'm going to cover the Amon Ket lore. You know, the storyline. You know the word cover kind of implies I'm going to take this seriously in any kind of way? Um, not really the case in case you missed my Shadows lore video. So Wizards posted the first chapter out of nine chapters on their website, and uh, it's always cool when they post the storyline before the official release. We're approximately seven words into it, and I already have a problem with it. Big surprise. So, as I've said, chapter one, as they so generously titled it, starts with deciding that a proactive approach is best. Most of the Gatewatch has gone after Nicol Bolas on Amon Ket to attack him head-on before he can set more of his schemes in motion. What the actual hell are they talking about? That is not the start of a story. So I looked up and it says, oh, previous story, renewal. And I'm like, what, is there a chapter zero? Did they go with like computer level, you know, counting where all counting starts at zero? If so, that would be hilarious because you guys know from all my top 10 videos that that's the recurring joke that I always use. Uh, unfortunately, um, they're referring to, I guess, the final chapter from the uh, Aether Revolt story, which I did not read. Um, nor am I going to because this thing is like 37 miles long. Um, no thanks. So I hit control F and type the word bolus, you know, as you do. Um, bunch of references to him. I don't know. Something about Tezzeret and they defeated him and I don't freaking know. I'm sure they referred to Nicol Bolas and what the hell he was doing like six chapters back before even this. I think we all know I'm not going to read it. So let's just jump right into this without knowing what the hell's going on. Good job, wizards. I guess they really, 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 really do not want new players to the game to be able to just jump into the storyline. You basically have to keep reading back. Oh, but then you got to keep reading back. And to understand why they landed on that plane, oh, you got to keep reading back. I'm not in high school, this isn't English class. I'm gonna start reading right here, thanks. So with zero context whatsoever, let's keep on reading. And no, I'm not gonna literally read it word for word. That would just be stupid and probably a copyright violation. I'm going to paraphrase this desolator style. Anyway, the other part of the intro though is with no plan and no information. <laughs> What's that like, guys? The five planeswalkers set off to take down an elder dragon on a mysterious and unfamiliar plane. Which five planeswalkers? Hell if I know. So I guess they all show up in, uh, you know, the desert on Amon Cat, and uh, they claim that there's um, two suns in the sky. So we're in a binary system. Pretty cool. So like one sun's overhead and one's on the horizon. So I think we're going to have like a complete lack of night here or something. Very, very sci-fi. I actually do like it already. Although, okay, we're like one paragraph in. I'm calling it right now. First sun is a sun. Second sun is Emrakul's cousin, Jimrakul. Yeah, because she's, you know, seen as female, so it's it's her, her male cousin. In fact, they don't even call him Jim Rakul. They just call him Ra for short. Oh, God of the Sun, what's up? Boom, solved it. Whoa. Spoiler alert. Sorry, I had to ruin it for you guys. I hope in the future Jim Rakul takes out uh, Nicol Bolas because I hate him. I don't know one single thing about him. I've seen his card. It looks like OP garbage. Um, but that's about my extent of, of the knowledge of Nicol Bolas. Um, but he reminds me of Ugin, and I hated playing against his card. So, uh, yeah. Screw every Dragon's Planeswalker. They're all overpowered, and I hate them all. All two of them. So they land. They look at the sun. There's some kind of sandstorm or some crap. And then literally nothing happens. And it says earlier on Kaladesh, dot, 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 flashback scene pretend it's like some crappy 80s analog you know effect glimmering the screen okay so anyway during this wonderful flashback it looks like uh jace ajani gideon and liliana are four of the five. Oh, and it looks like nissa is the fifth one so don't know what happened to chandra she probably stayed on her home plane for a while i don't know oh wait no they mentioned chandra too so now there's six of them and they said five and I'm already confused maybe a johnny isn't considered part of the gate watch i don't freaking know Pretty sure there's a picture of him high five in the, the player on the Oath of Johnny card, so you got me. They uh, started talking about what their plan of attack is, and <laughs> Chandra says, Pop in, find a dragon, roast a dragon. Couldn't have said it better myself, Chandra. Apparently, there was something about like Tezzeret might have like gone to war Nicol Bolas, so he might be on Amon Cat. I don't know. Probably would have helped to read the Aether Revolt story, but uh, yeah, I, I have better things to do. 
Okay, so they said like three sentences and then planes walk to Amon Ket. So that was a flashback to approximately 30 seconds in the past. Oh my god, I wish this was a movie so that cinema sins could tear it apart. If you're gonna do a flashback, have it be like a week ago or like a day ago or like this morning, not 60 seconds ago. This is some crap writing and you guys are like, you don't know writing, you're making fun of them, blah, 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 they're professional authors. First of all, I don't think they are. And secondly, haha, <laughs> remember how I always say I can make fun of uh, MTGO because I used to be a professional programmer? And you know how I can make fun of the cards because I have college level training and one degree in graphics design? Yeah, I used to be an author for one of the biggest companies in the world, a paid author, and I was one of their top paid authors. So I can tear this apart too. I'm qualified to tear just about anything apart. Yes, I wrote exclusively nonfiction. So what? Get over it. So to summarize their impression of the wonderful plane of Amon Ket, um, they're all full of sand after about five seconds and it's hot as balls. They keep switching around um, the first person view to different planeswalkers and I think Chandra, her description was like the best. Also, quality, quality writing. Uh, I guess this is the home of a giant evil dragon who sends evil henchmen out to destroy all that's good on other worlds with their evilness. So never mind, this place makes total sense. I think that line might have actually been written by, like, the the planners of the set trying to, like, justify it. So Chandra melts the sand into, like, a glass dome, I guess, and then they all, like, get in it. Kind of odd. And then we get the quality writing. I mean, I didn't want to directly quote this so much, but you guys just have to experience this with me. It says, Liliana leads the way and the rest join her and soon we're all standing inside looking out at the blur of sand and dust creating a constant sound like a thousand mothers shushing their children at some kind of weird place where there'd be a thousand mothers and their children gathered. I think we found the next some writing award winner. I don't know the name of a writing award. So apparently whoever wrote this has no idea what the greenhouse effect was because they're all like hot as hell so they get inside of a glass dome. But then again, you're not going to get very clear glass without um, seaweed, I believe. I think that's what makes glass pure or something like that. So they finally reveal why the hell she built like a little dome out of glass and sand and whatever. Um, it's to protect them from the sandstorm. That would have been nice to know when she was making it. I was deeply confused. So Nissa's all doing her telepathy thing, trying to figure out, you know, if there's anything living nearby because she's like little Miss Green Mana. And she's like, oh my God, there's like nothing living. Everything's like dead and it smells like decay and I can barely sense the ley lines that carry Green Mana. That's weird. And Chandra's like, whoop, party! You know, fire mana everywhere. What's up? So they see the uh, big old nickel bolus horns off in the horizon and they're like, let's go that away. So they're about to take off walking towards it once the storm subsides and, uh, zombie attack. Not just any zombie attack. Sand zombies! They were standing right on top of sand zombies the whole time, apparently. So, yeah, the zombies start trying to pull them down into the, uh, sand, and Liliana's like, ha ha, my specialty, boom, basically rots them twice as much so that they, uh, like, decay and all that. Apparently the scent of decay was in the air already, which, by the way, this place is probably like 110 degrees. That is physically impossible. It requires, um, for there to be bacteria and decay and scent, there has to be water and there isn't there in the desert. Good job researching it, wizards. So Liliana quickly uh, takes control of like every zombie around her because that's her thing. But then some like jackal looking dude jumps out of the uh, sand and Gideon cuts him in half, like really grossly. So then it's like all out zombie war, which uh, would have been totally cool to watch if it was a movie, although this story so far utterly sucks. And Liliana's like, my zombies versus your zombies, let's go, just all out brawl, like total zombie ponage. Uh, but then, you know, she's not really keeping up, even with Chandra just flamethrower nuking them all, um, and Gideon's helping and everybody's helping, some of them are getting bit and crap, and she's like, oh damn, this ain't working, because there is, like, a lot of freaking zombies, like, World War Z level of zombies. So then she kind of expands her spell, and she's like, everybody just flee, just, like, everybody piss off, like, straight up Dungeons & Dragons first edition, like, turn undead. So most of the zombies bailed quicker than, like, Trump protesters when they get out the tear gas, and the rest of them were, uh, you know, totally destroyed by the rest of the planes. Walkers. They also reveal something very interesting. Liliana brought the chain veil with her. It is like in her pocket, uh, but she didn't have to take it out and use it because um, the other planeswalkers helped her out, basically. So that's cool. Can't wait to see if that card comes back. So during the fight, Jace just utterly disappeared. Either literally that's what he did, he turned invisible, or he just like bailed, or one of the zombies got him. They're not really sure. And then suddenly, all went dark. Dun, dun, dun. And then they switch over to Jace's point of view. It just opens with, I hate this plane. 
So do we, Jace. So do we. It's just one giant Yu-Gi-Oh ripoff. So it turns out, since, uh, you know, Jace does mind magic and undead basically don't even have a mind, uh, he was useless, so yeah, he turned invisible and bailed. So Jace's more elaborate uh, opinion of this plane is it's a crap hole and Nicol Bolas was an idiot for picking it, or making it. They're not really sure at this point. Now, being the unraveler of secrets, or at least formerly, um, he starts thinking about all the technical stuff, like why is this this way? Why is that that way? And he comes to the conclusion that the, the two giant Nicol Bolas horns in the background are not just some egotistical monument to himself. That's not really his MO. He does stuff for a purpose. So probably some magical mana thing, enchantment, whatever the hell, I don't know, some purpose to them. They, they do something. So that'll be pretty interesting to read about in the future. And just as they think, you know, the zombie ambush is over and all that, Nissa yells, Sandworm! So basically, it comes out of the ground shooting sand and um, eats Liliana. No, I'm not kidding. I do admit I would have made that joke even if the story didn't say that she got swallowed by it. But nope, she disappeared into the gullet of the worm, as they put it. And then a second worm uh, jumped out of the sand dune. Aw, crap. So Liliana's formerly under control zombies were like, ha ha, we're free, and attacked Gideon. Um, and this was like, well, Liliana's dead. Like her zombies turned on us, she dead. So Nissa wanted to like, you know, start blasting spells around because that's fun. Uh, but there is basically no green mana, not enough to um, cast her spell at least. I know what that's like personally, running out of mana and not being able to uh, cast the spell you want. So I can totally identify with her. The mana screwedness is real. So Gideon's storyline consists of him uh, barely able to fight the zombies that now turned on him. That's about it. Uh, Nissa helped him out in the fight uh, by turning her staff into a sword and just chopping away at him like manually instead of using spells, which I kind of wish I could do when I get mana screwed. I mean, the moral of the story right now is if you get mana screwed, pull out a sword and attack your opponent directly. So Chandra goes nuts and just starts incinerating everything, which, um, you know, yeah, this is pretty much what I would do. She nukes one of the worms. There's actually like six of them now. So, uh, yeah, single-handedly taking one down. She ain't joking. So Jace, like, reads the mind to the worm and is like, oh, they like to eat scorpions. So he creates a little illusionary scorpion, has it go scuttling across the dune, so one of them chases it. Ha <laughs> ha, brilliant. So apparently one of the uh, worms doesn't look so good, to say the least. And uh, Chandra thinks it's going to throw up, but instead it just kind of rots from the inside out and Liliana climbs out of its stomach. Ew. And uh, apparently she put on the chain veil on her face. I have no idea what it does other than make a planeswalker stronger. And I literally just like gleaned that from the cards. Well, the card, the chain veil. I wasn't really following the lore in, uh, what, M14-ish? So all of her like skin tattoos are glowing and crap. She basically goes Super Saiyan and uh, you know, that's pretty awesome. And then she collapses. So got to work on that Super Saiyan form. So Gideon just like shreds one of the worms, just about kills another one with his uh, Saral or whatever it's called. I call it a totally awesome metal whip thing. It's more descriptive, honestly. Nissa, despite being apparently useless, um, drives her sword right into the skull of one of the worms after jumping on top of it and kills him by like, I don't know, hitting his brain or something. That's pretty uh, baller. Now see, everybody underestimates Nissa, but I mean, she ain't playing. So Jay starts talking inside of everybody's head like, oh my god, we gotta like planes walk back to Kaladesh and regroup and come up with a better plan because he's a little pansy. So then the uh, worm that was killed by Liliana from exiting its stomach, still with a hole in its stomach, uh, comes back to life as an undead worm. You know, the old uh, boss battle cliche where you're like, oh, I killed the boss. Oh crap, he's back and more powerful and undead this time. Fantabulous. So this is all like in tune with all this like hippie chakra crystal waving new age quantum BS, uh, aka the ley lines of mana. And she seems to think that it was like the world's magic network itself that resurrected the, the worm into like the undead. And she got the impression that like everything dead is cursed to like walk as undead. So it seems that was probably Nicol Bolas is doing. And of course, you're probably drawing the parallels with the embalm mechanic where, uh, oh, you killed it. And now you gotta kill it again, and this time it's undead. Get it? Story tie-in, get it? So now all the worms are, you know, jumping up as zombies, and they're like, oh crap. And then uh, Gideon has a choice to save Liliana or save Nyssa, and then, oh, giant dog-faced Egyptian god ex machina. All of a sudden, from the horizon, a burning white arrow of light just nukes the living balls off the worm. It just turns him straight into ash, which uh, I feel like maybe then he's not coming back after that. That saved the one that was going after Liliana. 
And then the other worms were like, ha oh, crap, and they decided to uh, flee. Oh man, you try that crap on me in Exile 3, which by the way is almost definitely playing in the background of this um, <laughs> video right now. I will throw up walls of force, ice barriers, freaking force barriers, fire barriers, I don't care. You ain't getting out of there, okay? If I cast a mass fear spell and you're like, I'm out, I'm, I'm going to flee the, the, the fight. Nope, no you ain't. I'm locking you in. It's on. But apparently the Planeswalkers have a different strategy. So big old jackal face god comes uh, zipping up at about a million miles an hour, about uh, 70 feet tall. Shows up, pokes one of the worms, you know, just make sure it's dead, you know, and poke it again, just like barbecue. Boom! That thing turns to dust too. Goodbye. Can't do that crap with Thassa's barbecue fork, can ya? And apparently giant red jackal god has the same strategy I do, because one of the worms is like, ha, <laughs> bye, and tries to uh, burrow back in, down into the ground, and, and uh, I'll say she, um, <laughs> drives her, her little stabby thing into the ground and bzz, bzz, fries him. He's like, don't tase me, bro, but then he turns into ash. Hey, that's how red deck wins works, man. Everybody gets burned. Nobody gets away. So Gideon's like, oh, she's pretty cool. And then the uh, giant jackal god lady is like, you know, just nods at him and then zips away. She zips away onto the horizon at insane speed back towards the uh, horns, which they were heading to anyway. So Gideon's like, oh my God, there's gods on this plane. I totally did not expect that at all. Well, you should have read the uh, lore spoilers from like a year ago, Gideon. Now, actually, it's revealed that the arrow of light came from a different god out of sight, clearly the cat archer white god uh she's always depicted uh holding a bow so now he's effectively seen two of them so once all of his uh, injured friends get up and start healing themselves and crap they don't believe him except for nissa kind of because they're a bunch of idiots oh no gideon just killed all the undead worms himself solo while you were unconscious yeah that's what happened that makes more sense freaking idiots so the $64,000 question is, how could a world supposedly ruled by an evil ancient dragon planeswalker also be home to the divine? Why would there possibly be gods on Amon Ket? Okay, Desolator spoiler alert. They probably all showed up on the plane, got together, summoned freaking Captain Planet with their five rings of elementalness, and then uh, locked him away. That's my theory. In fact, they locked him away inside the horns. How about that? Yeah, catch me outside. How about that? I solved it. Uh, I'm going full-blown shadows over Innistrad clue solving just crazy up in here. Also, they use really lazy, obvious writing. So they all make their way towards the horns and, um, you know, they get attacked by hyenas and Chandra tries to, you know, flame them away and then they get attacked by more undead and Liliana takes care of it. And uh, basically they're starting to realize that the Middle East is one giant crap hole. Oh, did I say the Middle East? I meant the plane of Amon Ket. What the hell's the difference? Seriously, you guys ever wonder who the hell moved to like North Africa and the Middle East and was like, yeah, we were walking and walking and walking, but this place seems nice. All this sand and complete lack of water. Let's stay here. Let's not keep walking to the perfectly nice Europe. I mean, it's not like they had like Google Earth or something, but still, I mean, I wouldn't have been like, yeah, this seems like a nice place to sit down. It's only 110 degrees in the day and freaking below zero at night or whatever the hell. Yeah. Yeah. Let's settle here. Not only settle here, let's build some freaking pyramids. I'm starting to think that the ancestors in that area were kind of stupid. Either that or they were just sick of walking and then, okay, then I'll give it to them. I mean, I walk like a quarter mile and I'm like, I'm done with this crap. So, you know, whatever. So they finally reach like one of the highest dunes, climb over it. And then they look over it and they're like, oh my God. Oh, there was like actual plants and trees and crap, like a little river and all that. And some buildings and like the, the actual nice part of Egypt. From on top of the dune, they could actually see that one corner had a Starbucks. And then you go like, you go like around like the main street and then like take a left and then like take another left past the parking lot. Boom, another Starbucks. That's how they know it's a good city. And right across the street, there was a Denny's. And so they're all looking and they're like, wow, look at all these like monuments and statues and like all kinds of, you know, obelisks. And they're like, wow, they really stole a lot of stuff from Egypt so that they didn't have to come up with their own lore. Yeah. Yeah. The planeswalkers are breaking the fourth wall. So there's like people walking around and crap. And apparently the whole city is covered by a magic barrier that keeps the sand out. In fact, even birds couldn't fly through it, it said. So that's, that's kind of neat. So Liliana was the only person who's been to Amon Cat before. And she's like, I don't remember this. So they all start walking towards Barrier, trying to get into the city, and that's pretty much where it ends. Although they do have an uh, epilogue, I think it would be. Is it, is it prologue or... Huh, I'm usually good with Latin prefixes. Whatever, a post-log. <laughs> let's, let's, let's call it a captain's log. We're going Star Trek up in here. Captain's log. 
whatever the hell year it is. As the five descended the across the sand, yes, that is exactly what it says, the whisper of the lonely wind brushed where they walked, shifting the sands behind them, erasing their footprints, carving new dunes and sweeping flat new expanses. Overhead, the first sun slid toward, towards its zenith. Ooh, are we going to see the black sun zenith and the white sun zenith and the, I assume, other three color zeniths, but I don't remember seeing the cards? That would be awesome. It actually said all that word for word. I'm still reading it. Um, while the second held steady at its position on the horizon, its fiery stare fixed on the world below. No, actually, it's an inanimate object. Now, if it was the Eye of Sauron... <laughs> Within minutes, the desert was as it ever had been, with only the two suns bearing witness to the silent eternal. The wind carried on, oblivious to all that came before. What will happen to our heroes on the next Dragon Ball Z? I'm surprised I could get away with adding that line at the end, actually. Potential crossover? I mean, I think the Dragon Ball Z uh, trading card game got shut down. I'm still waiting for, I mean, like, forget, like, Unscrewed or whatever people nicknamed the third unhinged set and unglued set that totally isn't ever coming out. I want to see Meme Edition, where they just memeify a bunch of cards. <laughs> just alternate art, cat memes, and internet memes, and, you know, freaking, like, ain't nobody got time for that instead of, like, delay. Oh, you thought this creature was alive? Nope, Chuck Testa. They would sell so many packs it would almost pay for the legal fees from everybody suing them from using public domain stuff and then selling it in fact make it an unset they could call it unmemed the dankness is real hashtag make magic dank again so that's it for the um storyline thus far if you guys like this um show your love by hitting the thumbs up button if you thought it was stupid as hell then show your love by hitting the thumbs up button if you thought that it was just so-so, kind of a dumb video, dumb comedy, and I suck and I shouldn't even be on YouTube, then, uh, you know, show your support that I should improve by um, leaving a thumbs up. If you don't know what the hell Magic the Gathering is, or how you ended up on this video, or why you watched the whole thing, just leave a thumbs up. I, I don't know why, just do it. But yeah, if you guys liked it, I'll, <laughs> quote, cover the rest of the, the Lauren storyline... Which, honestly, I would recommend you just go read. Because it's actually not bad. I mean, I know I made fun of some of the typos and the stylistic stuff and the art. But I was greatly exaggerating. This was very, very, very well written compared to uh, some of the stuff in the past. And even just in general compared to, like, books. I didn't care for the over, you know, descriptive imagery. But I think, you know, Wizards leans on the authors to do that. Because it's kind of like, you know, the whole art-heavy, lore-heavy style, you know, ambiance kind of thing. So kudos to you, Michael Yi Chow. Uh, probably massacring that. Um, he's the one who wrote it. And uh, yeah. So yeah, definitely let me know if you want uh, more lore stories. If you want lore that doesn't suck, check out Saibon's channel. Link maybe in the description. I'll probably forget by the time this encodes. And I'll see you guys next video. And uh, catch me in Amon Cat. How about that? Amon Cat. How about that?